We are taking an intense journey tonight, a journey that takes us to a place of testing, struggle, and ultimately growth, the desert. The desert soil might seem dry, no life or growth, but that is exactly the environment where God chose to grow the faith of the Israelites. The desert paved the way for flourishing and beauty. We're going to explore the meaning and the symbolism of the desert in detail. We'll uncover how the journey of the children of Israel models our own individual journeys with God. We'll unlock the connections between the test that the Israelites faced in the desert and the test that Yeshua Jesus himself faced too. A place that appears lifeless and harsh can in actuality reveal the pathway to our own spiritual growth. Let's see how right now on Mysteries of the Messiah. Israel made 42 stops on their journey from Egypt to the Promised Land. These 42 stops, the rabbis tell us, spiritually and metaphorically point to the journeys we need to make from our own personal Egypts to our own personal Promised Lands. Egypt in Hebrew is Mitzrayim. Mitzrayim literally means a place of confinement or restriction. That confined and restricted place of Egypt was actually the womb in which God birthed Israel from a family into a great and mighty nation. The womb is a tight place. The birthing canal is a restricted place. All of us need to go through the tight places and seasons of constrictions in order to be birthed into our destiny. Think about it for a moment. If you turn on a spigot and water comes out, it's just very loose. But if you attach a hose to it, it gains velocity and momentum. The tight places and the things that we go through that squeeze us, give us the velocity and momentum we need to go into the fullness of God's promise on our journey into our promise and potential. 42 is the numerical value of the Hebrew word kivodi. Kivodi means my glory. Those 42 stops in the desert are meant to bring forth God's glory in our life. Even the tight places, even the constrictions and the contractions are meant to bring about His glory in our life. Even as it is written, these momentary light afflictions are producing in us an eternal weight of glory. But 42 is also the number of words in Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9 that begin Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You will love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. The 42 words in these verses connect to the 42 stops in the wilderness because our journeys through life are meant to teach us how to love God completely and fully and serve Him alone. 42 is also the number of letters contained in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 and 2 that begins, Bereshit bara Elohim et ha-shemayim ve'et ha'aretz. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and void. That's so significant because Israel's 42 stops all took place in the desert. And so the formlessness and void is a metaphor of the desert, which is a place of formlessness and void and chaos. But of course, there's still more that connects to this in a very important way. In the genealogy of Yeshua found in Matthew chapter one, there's actually 42 generations that are listed. There's three sets of 14. Why is that significant? Because Israel's 42 stops on their journey to the promised land ultimately is meant to culminate in the person of Yeshua, Jesus. He is the ultimate fulfillment of the Torah, the writing, and the prophets. Not everyone who left Egypt made it to the promised land, but when we receive Yeshua as our Messiah and believe in Him, we don't have to worry about dying in the desert. We have the assurance that we are going to enter in to the new Jerusalem, to the kingdom of God and inherit eternal life.
Have you ever seen one of those press conferences before a boxing match? Two opponents sit in front of microphones, answering questions about the upcoming fight. They promise the whole world on live television that they will be declared winner after the match. They speak with total confidence. After the match, only one of those two opponents will be victorious. Sometimes the outcome is totally unexpected. A huge upset. Maybe the smaller underdog scores a critical knockout at the last moment against the undefeated champ. It's something no one would have predicted. The promise that the undefeated champ made was false. Now you're not sure if he can even win his next fight. No one could have predicted his defeat. So how could you predict the next one? Was it a fluke? Was the underdog really that great? Will the champion pull through for a win next time? Just like that, you've lost your faith in him. We have been conditioned to be skeptical of promises, and for good reason. They get broken. But ultimately, faith is built on promises. So how can we have faith in anyone at all? With God, the journey of faith looks very different than the faith we have in the people around us. For one, God's promises aren't broken. They're kept, always, no matter what. Then, why is our faith challenged and tested if God's promises are completely reliable? The testing isn't in the promise. The testing is getting there. We know the what of God's promises, but we may not understand the when, how, or why. That's where faith comes in. Take the Israelites in the desert, for instance. They knew the what, a promised land. That wasn't the hard part. God's promise was beautiful. They questioned the how. An arduous trek through a harsh landscape full of danger, hunger, and pain. Oh, Abraham promised descendants. He loved the what, but he struggled with the when. It wasn't on his timeline at all. Scripture describes that Abraham patiently endured before the promise was fulfilled. But here is the important part. In that waiting, in that struggle, Abraham's faith grew. Romans says no distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God. But he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. This is the difference between the promises made on earth and the promises of God. The journey to God's promises grows us. Our faith can blossom, and the tests we experience along the way help strengthen and shape our faith. When it comes to that boxing match, we might choose to not watch it at all. The next day, we can look up a 60-second highlight reel. All of the heavy punches and heroic moments, but none of the stumbling. We miss the moments in the corner of the ring recovering, moments when the boxers are on the edge of giving up. We miss the journey, only concerned about the outcome. The promises God makes are true. They are the thing we can count on. There is no shortcut 
We don't get to look up the highlights and skip the little moments. Abraham didn't, Moses didn't, Joseph didn't, and we can't either. But that's the point. What would happen if instead of questioning if God's promises will be fulfilled, we embrace the journey he has for us on the way there? The desert is a place where God strengthens the faith of his people and teaches them dependence upon him. But the desert is also a place of testing. God brought Israel into the desert for 40 years to test them to see what was in their hearts, to humble them, to teach them dependence, to see if they were going to faithfully follow his commandments. It's for all these reasons that God brought so many of the great men and women of faith into the desert. He brought Moses into the desert. He brought the children of Israel into the desert. He brought King David into the desert. He brought Elijah, John the Baptist, and even Paul for a season all spent time in the desert. But what's really interesting is that he brought Yeshua Jesus into the desert as well for a time of testing. Some of you might be like, he's the son of God, the perfect son of God. Why would he need to spend a time in the desert? And that's one of the mysteries that we have to look at. What we have to understand is that Yeshua Jesus was the second Adam. In the person of Yeshua Jesus, he had to undo and redeem everything that the first man and woman failed and got wrong. All died in the first Adam, all are made alive in the second Adam. So just like Adam and Eve failed the test with the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the second Adam had to pass the test and get it right. He's also the one man Israel. What that means is that the history of Israel is ultimately relived and fulfilled in the person of Jesus. Think about it for a moment. Just like Israel came out of Egypt, Yeshua had to come out of Egypt. Just like Herod tried to kill the Jewish babies, so the Pharaoh killed the Jewish babies. So in the same way, everywhere that Israel failed, Yeshua Jesus ultimately had to get it right to repair and redeem God's chosen people. But of course, there was still even more. He's also the greater than Moses. Moses, when he was leading the people in the wilderness, even he, the greatest prophet and miracle worker in the history of God's people, even he failed when he struck the rock to bring forth the water. He lacked faith. And as a result of that, God said to him, you are not going to go into the land, but you are going to die in the wilderness. Even Moses failed the test. So Yeshua, as the promise greater than Moses, ultimately had to pass the test that even Moses couldn't. And we see this in the temptation of Yeshua in the wilderness. The first thing that happened is after he was immersed, after he was baptized, he was led into the desert for 40 days. Why 40 days? Because Israel wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. So he literally had to do in 40 days, or we could say undo in 40 days, the failures of Israel over those 40 years. During the first temptation, Satan comes to Yeshua and tests him by telling him to turn the rocks into bread. This is at the end of 40 days. Yeshua hadn't eaten. He was so hungry and starving. I can barely fast for one day. Imagine 40. And Yeshua passes the test. He said, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of the Father. This ties back to Israel's test because one of Israel's major failures was constantly grumbling about the bread and the food that they were eating in the desert. So since Israel failed with food, not trusting God for provision, Yeshua passes the test to trust God for the provision. The second test that Yeshua had to go through was Satan took him and showed him all the nations of the world. And he said, if you bow down to me, 
All of these could be yours. This also ties back to Israel's testing because what we see is that Israel constantly made the mistake of falling into idolatry. Even right after God gave them the Ten Commandments, they committed the sin of the golden calf, and that happened a number of times during their wanderings in the wilderness. But Yeshua doesn't compromise. He won't fall into idolatry because he understands and wants us to understand that God hates idolatry. It's not because he's petty or jealous, but because he knows that those who worship idols become like them. He knows that those who worship idols become fragmented and broken by those idols. And the very thing that we worship, if it's not the Lord, we become enslaved to them. It's because God cares for us and doesn't want us to be fractured, but whole, that he doesn't want us to bow down and worship idols. Yeshua, Jesus, of course, passes the test. The third test during Yeshua's temptation was that Satan took him to the top of the temple, to the highest point, to the pinnacle, and said, why don't you jump off to demonstrate that God has given his angels charge over you? And this also ties back to Moses as well, because at the end of Moses' life, God took him to the top of Mount Nebo and showed him the depth and the breadth of the land. And actually Mount Nebo is right across from the mountain of temptation where Yeshua was going through all of this, where it all began. But Yeshua doesn't compromise. He stays the course and he's faithful. And we have to be faithful as well when we go through the testing when we go through the desert seasons, when we experience temptations in our lives. The testing you experience is never to hurt you, but testing is meant to lead to blessing. It's meant to lead to the release of God's promise and potential in your life. And the way we overcome temptation is the same way Yeshua did. With each of the three temptations, he quoted scriptures. In the same way, we need to know the word and we need to quote it and stand on it and declare it when we go through those desert seasons and those times of temptation, because when we know the word, the word of God will set us free and ultimately lead us into the fullness of God's promise for our life. People in the desert need food, but even more than food, they need water. And one of the things God did for the children of Israel was brought forth water from the rock for millions of the children of Israel. But what's amazing is that there is this Jewish tradition that there was actually a rock that followed them in the desert and the elders would cry out to the rock in songs, spring up a well, and literally streams would come forth from this rock and be able to give water to the multitude of the thirsty children of Israel. Years later, after the children of Israel go into the promised land, they were completely dependent upon God to provide the early and the latter rains for their crops. It wasn't like Egypt that naturally irrigated itself with the overflow of the Nile. And on the Feast of Tabernacles, Sukkot every year, there would be this elaborate water drawing ceremony and they would march around the altar and they would pour out water from the pool of Siloam, asking God to pour out the water, pour out his blessing, pour out his salvation. And on the seventh day, known as Hosanna Rabbah, the great day, they do that seven times. And John 7:37 tells us, that Yeshua Jesus gets up at the Feast of Tabernacles, the holiday that celebrates God's provision of bread and water from the rock and his presence in the wilderness during the 40 years of wandering. Yeshua gets up at the water drawing ceremony as they're pouring out the water and says, whoever is thirsty, let him come to me and drink because living waters will flow from the innermost being. Could you imagine that? I mean, that's some chutzpah, that's some holy boldness. What he's saying is that that water that followed you in the desert, that gave your ancestors 
of what they needed to quench their thirst, guess what? That was me. And there's actually a Jewish tradition that Paul quotes in Corinthians. He says, they all drank from the same rock and that rock was Messiah. Messiah says, listen, what you've been praying for for generations, I'm the answer to that prayer and I will meet your spiritual thirst through this living water that will flow from your innermost being. Rabbi, I have a question. It's about really discernment. How do we know when we're in a season of testing or in a season of punishment? Yeah, I think that's a question all of us have had at times, but I think there's really even a more important question, which is what does God want me to learn from what I am going through right now at this moment? Because sometimes it's hard to tell exactly why I'm going through what it is that I'm going through. But the question is, who does God want to be for me in this season? How does God want to reveal himself and how does he want me to get to know him in a new way? I think we have to turn the negative and find the positive and understand that our deserts are actually doorways to our destiny. The pits and the prisons and the problems that we face actually is what brings out our potential. The bigger the problems, the bigger the promise for your life because the promotion comes after we've been faithful to face the problems and to remain true to God in the middle of it, like Moses did, like Joseph did, like David did, like Ye Yeshua did. And to understand that God is not punitive, he's redemptive. So even when something negative that we're going through is the result of a bad decision that we make, because there are consequences for our actions. Yes, there's grace, but there's cause and effect. You will reap what you sow on some level. But because God is redemptive in nature and not punitive in nature, he will work it all out for good. And no matter what it is we're going through, God can bring about some benefit in our lives if we approach it from that perspective. So in the Israelites' time in the desert, not all of them survived. Does that mean that not all of us are gonna survive our own personal deserts? Yeah, I mean, I think sometimes it might feel that way. You know, we gotta look at the context of why that generation died in the wilderness. And God is very specific in the book of Numbers. He says, you saw my glory, you saw my miracles. I mean, think about everything that they saw, all the ways that God tangibly showed up for them in Egypt and in the wilderness. And it says, yet you did not believe and you did not obey my voice, and you tested me these 10 times. So it was a generation that experienced so much that they were held to a higher standard, okay? So I think we need to keep that in mind. But I do think practically that if we choose unbelief instead of having faith and trust, there are parts of the blessing of God for our life that we could potentially miss out on. I mean, Yeshua didn't do miracles in some places because they had no faith. Where there was faith, there was a different level of experiencing the goodness, the presence, and the blessing of God. But again, God is gracious, right? It says that generation tested him 10 times, right? God is gracious, compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in kindness. So it's it's important to understand, it's not like if we lack faith one time or we mess up sometimes that that disqualifies us or God is gonna forsake us. But if we habitually, continually harden our hearts, resist the will of God, continue not to do what he asks us to do, then there is a possibility that part of what God called us to, we could miss out on. And I think we need to make sure that we're diligent not to allow that to happen because Yeshua paid a high price when he died on the cross. 
He purchased our promise. He purchased our potential. And most importantly, he purchased our eternal life. But we need to make sure, like they say in business, don't leave anything on the table. I don't want to leave on the table anything that he paid such a high price for. So we need to make sure that we have the boldness and the faith to step out and to do what God asks us to do.